السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى بركاته again dear brothers sisters and everyone watching out there الحمد لله today is the second of the Hijjah one of the greatest uh, days of the year and we are we are blessed to be here with uh, Al Fitra and presenting our 10 days, 10 speakers program. And today I'm your brother Yusuf Abdul Jabbar, and I'll be having my host um, with my guest, uh, brother Ismail Beaumont uh, from um, London, but was also living in Medina for a long time and studying there, alhamdulillah. And also myself, I was there for six years. So our session today, alhamdulillah, is on the topic of life in Medina. Work, working, living, relaxing, spirituality. This is our topic uh, today. And the format will be, inshallah, I will remind myself and everyone else at the beginning of 10, 15 minutes about the virtues and blessings of Medina itself. Alhamdulillah, then our guest will share some of his experiences, his stories, uh, my story also, and more importantly, any questions that you have. The WhatsApp number is there. Please send across your questions. Um, and also you should be getting the family together. Remember, this is a, a family time to benefit, to enjoy, and uh, join on to YouTube. Subscribe, like, share uh, on the One Eid Al, -Al Fitra uh, TV station and channel on youtube so please do log in um and tune in for this exciting session between uh, myself and ismail Shah ismail we spent over 13 years in medina you know living working studying and a blessing that we've enjoyed so this will be really a a great session that i am looking forward to uh, everyone to benefit together with us inshallah also we've got lots of different campaigns that we would like you to support uh with the one eid uh, I'll discuss some of that later, insha'Allah. Right, so what I'll do, as I mentioned, I'll start off and remind everyone about the, the virtues of uh, al Medina. You've got, um, alhamdulillah, there are so many great blessings of Medina. Okay. Um, Abdurrahman, if you could, our uh, guest is also waiting. So if you do let him in, inshallah, I will um, start with our uh, preparation for Medina. Okay, brilliant. Assalamu alaikum. Allah wa barakatuh. Can you hear me, Akhi? Yes, mashallah, perfect. Good stuff. Um, great, so we've just, we've just started. Alhamdulillah, I've explained to them the format of our session today that I will start off with a 10 minute reminder on the virtues um, of Medina. Then I will invite you to share some of your journey to Medina. Um, and also our uh, question line is open for on WhatsApp. The brothers and sisters, anyone watching will send any questions they have uh, about living and working in Medina. Um, yeah, so that, that's where we're at. So you've uh, joined at a good time. Jazakallah khair for your time. My pleasure, Akhi. Thank you so much for, for allowing me to um, have this opportunity to catch up. It's been a long time. And also reach out to everybody on your platform. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and accept it from you. Yeah, and I mentioned that this is a 10-day program. We're on day two, one of the best days of the year. So if everyone also renews their intention, as our scholars have always reminded, before we do any action, we renew our intention that you're listening, of course, to benefit from the virtues of Medina and living and moving. However, if you renew your intention that this is to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the whole session will turn into uh, good deeds on Yom Al-Qiyamah, inshallah. So everybody, uh, this is a reminder for you and for me. So we will proceed, inshallah, that I want to mention 
around 10 points regarding the virtues of al Madina uh, and Nabawi. The Prophet وسلم, we know from the seerah, he spent 23 years of his uh, life in the revelation of the Quran and Rasulullah spent 13 years in Mecca and 10 years in Medina. So slightly shorter period uh, of his da'wah and his uh, nabuwa and his revelations in Medina. Um, and from that, what we know is the Prophet وسلم, in Medina built the first Islamic authority, Islamic community, Islamic systems. So the transition from Makkah to Medina was something significant. Makkah itself was the Muslims in a minority. The Muslims were in a minority, were in hostile situation, uh, being persecuted, um, attacked. And however, Medina was totally different, subhanAllah. It was the stage of the happy, greater, more blessed, beautiful days for the Muslim community, the, the migrants and Islam in general, how it built up. So this is important, the two phases, the Meccan and the Madanin phase. Now, the Prophet we have a number of different hadith. Again, I've tried to stick to the authentic ones because unfortunately some people, they get carried away and narrate some weak or fabricated hadith about the blessings and virtues of Medina. We need to stay away from this because the Prophet said, you know, anyone who attributes anything to the Prophet which is not what he has said, then let him take his seat in the hellfire. Um, and so we don't want to go near any of this. So the ha first hadith we know, the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Huraira narrated that Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, uh, I was ordered to migrate to a town uh, which will swallow or conquer other towns and it is called Yathrib. We know this is the old name uh, and it's been changed to Medina. And this is Medina. And it turns out bad people as a furnace removes the impurities of med uh, iron. So. What it is, the, the Medina itself is a blessed place and those who are impure or those who don't deserve those who then Medina is kind of cycling out these people and throwing them out. As the Prophet Hassan gives the example here of the furnace when it, it spits out kind of the uh, ash and these things. And we have the hadith of uh, Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, reports that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whosoever has the means to die in Medina, let him die there. For I shall intercede on his behalf of everyone who dies there. SubhanAllah, this is reported by uh, Musnad of Imam Ahmed uh, and in Sunan uh, at Tirmidhi. Now, what's important here, of course, is SubhanAllah, there is um, a lot of people that live for 20, 25, 30 years, SubhanAllah. And then by Allah's plan, they leave Medina and they die and their uh, ending happens outside. This is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so, what is important, of course, is living in Medina is a great blessing. However, what's key is actually if Allah blesses us to die there, because what does it mean? That the Prophet Sallallahu will intercede for us on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And so that's a great blessing. Imagine having a recommendation from our beloved Prophet Sallallahu on Yawm Al-Qiyamah when we need it. Nothing can be more precious than this. Uh, the hadith of Anas, uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu said, Oh Allah, bestow on Medina twice the blessings you have bestowed on Mecca. So Medina has this lofty position. We know Mecca, la shak, no doubt, has a great place, the most holiest place in Islam. However, Medina itself has its uh, place also. Also, Abu Huraira reports that the Prophet ﷺ said, there are angels guarding the roads or entrances of Medina. Neither plague nor a Dajjal will be able to enter it. This is two points of uh, very important points to learn from here. One, we know that the Dajjal, when it will come, and Ahl Sunnah, we believe that he will come, and he will come in the shape of an individual person, not a system. And the description is given in the authentic Ahadith. And when he comes, he will roam the whole earth and cause corruption in, and will enter every single place, except Mecca and Medina. These are the uh, confirmed places that he will not be able to enter in Medina. From this Hadith, um, authentic proves that he will not be able to enter inside Medina. So anybody who is inside Medina at that time, inshallah, will be safe from the uh, fitan and the trials of a Dajjal. Secondly, something important here, the pandemic that we are facing at the moment about, and there was a lot of confusion, I remember a few months ago, people saying, well, coronavirus and COVID-19 is a plague, is a pandemic, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's not a plague. 
Uh, we know by the, the scientists and all those have uh, established that. But we know from this authentic hadith that if it was a plague, the scholars would say that it wouldn't have entered Medina. And we know there are people uh, have been affected in Medina. So it's more of a disease uh, because the definition of a plague is different. And the hadith clearly says plague does not enter uh, al Medina. Um, then we know some of the blessings and the virtues of uh, Masjid al Nabawi. And uh, the Prophet says, and this is uh, reported in Al Bukhari, do not set out on a journey except for three mosques Masajid, Al Masjid al Haram, the Masjid, the Mosque of Allah's Messenger, Masjid al Nabawi, and Masjid al Aqsa, the Al Jerusalem. And then the Prophet, وسلم, in another authentic hadith of Imam Muslim, reports prayer in this mosque of mine, Masjid al Nabawi, is better than a thousand prayers observed in any other mosque. Besides it, except that of Masjid al-Haram. And we know Haram al-Makki, subhanAllah, a hundred thousand. So there's no comparison between those two when it comes to the values of the prayers. Then we know about uh, a hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet Sallallahu said, between my house and the pulpit, there is a garden of the gardens of paradise. So ar uh, Ar-Riyadh al-Jannah. So we know there's a special place uh, in Medina. And the final point is regarding uh, Masjid al quba the first masjid that was built in Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu and that's in the in Medina itself. And uh, Alhamdulillah, we used to live five minutes drive barely from there. What a, what a blessing! And the in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, he narrates that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to go to the Masjid uh, Al Quba every Saturday, walking or riding, and he would pray uh, two rak'ah salah. And this is uh, reported by Imam Bukhari and Muslim. And this, um, so we know this a um, couple of uh, narrations that mention that the uh, a person who from his house makes wudu and makes intention to go to Masjid uh, Quba will be rewarded and prays to Raka will be rewarded the reward of Umrah. And um, so this is, we know it's authentic. And the scholars, they say, some say that it's Saturday, some say it, it, any day of the week um, uh, that you pray that you will be rewarded by the uh, reward of uh, Umrah. And uh, so there's another hadith which says, whoever goes out until he comes to the mosque, meaning Masjid al quba and prays there, that will be equivalent to Umrah. So Alhamdulillah, these are some of the um, quick, I wanted to remind you of some of the virtues and blessings so that Islamic uh, teachings, Medina has a lofty position, uh, not for the Arabs, not for the Bengalis, not for the Brits, not for the Saudis, but for the Muslim Ummah. Anybody who is a Muslim has rightfully the share uh, and to enjoy the blessings and can call it home and the home of the Prophet wasallam, the city of uh, light and the city of blessing and the, uh, you know, the establishment of the Islamic um, authority and Islamic first community, alhamdulillah. So this was just a brief reminder, uh, you know, for myself and for everyone there that uh, no doubt Medina is a great place. And those who have visited, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Those who have not, may Allah grant you the permission. And those who, uh, and all of us should make an intention now, as the hadith said, you know, make an intention to move to Medina. Keep the intention there. At least Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, uh, at some stage, maybe will facilitate you. And uh, there is no harm in having uh, good intentions in uh, good deeds. Uh, Barakallah fiqh. So what I'll do now, I'll bring in um, my dear brother, um, Imam, uh, Sheikh, entrepreneur, um, subhanAllah, I know he doesn't like all these things and we shouldn't do it, but these are just between me and him and Alhamdulillah, we spent some time on and off in Medina, here in the UK and between both of us, as I mentioned, at least 13, 14 years, which is almost a lifetime uh, in Medina. So we're going to now share some of these uh, journey with you. So I'm going to ask uh, Brother Ismail to come in and start some of his journey actually how even I don't know subhanAllah I've spent time with him I didn't get a chance to sit with him and ask him how he made it to Medina my journey is very long also and um, I might share some of it but I want to hear from him Bismillah uh, brother Ismail Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tamassaka bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-deen Jazakumullah wa khaira uh, Shaykh Yusuf for that, um, that beautiful reminder uh, and you're absolutely right Akhi um, I, 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 I don't like those titles um, the only title that I will you know own is the entrepreneur you know I'll, I'll, I'll take that one but as for Shaykh and, and stuff like that 
that's um that's way above you know anything that I'm, I'm deserving of but i do appreciate the uh the, uh, the kind words actually um okay as it relates to my journey to al medina um i first to be honest with you i don't remember the first time i ever was exposed to you know the islamic university of medina if i had to think back and like really you know uh squeeze my mind I would say that maybe one of the uncles and what my uncle told me about you know the possibility to study because when I became a Muslim I took the shahada on the the da'wah of my father you with me I didn't know any Muslims like any practicing Muslims I had Muslim maybe friends and associates in, in college or um, in school secondary school but the the, the bulk of my da'wah towards tawheed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam it came primarily from my father and also my uncle who at that time had probably been a muslim for maybe 5 6 years and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best so it was a very very different call that i got i didn't uh, for example get um swayed by you know, some brothers might get swayed by, oh, you know what, in Islam you can have uh, more than one wife. Oh, uh, yeah? Uh, let me find out more. Or somebody, some, some people might get swayed by fighting and jihad. People are, young people are impressionable. That wasn't my journey. I got called to Islam by adults, my father, my uncle, and they told me about Tawheed. Like my father, he used to make me, like, he, he wouldn't force me because at the time I was 19 when I became a Muslim. But he would in highly encourage me to listen to the Purpose of Life talk, the very, very famous Purpose of Life talk by uh, Brother Khalid Yassin. Um, and I remember back in the day, just hearing about the oneness of Allah. That's all my dad wanted me to, to learn, that, that God is one. So what he kept saying to me, God is one, until it became so natural in my heart that he used to say, listen, man, I know that you may not be ready to make that transition, but just pray that to Allah, that he doesn't take your life in that state. And even as a non-Muslim, Sheikh Yusuf, I used to make that dua. I used to make that dua, oh Allah, don't take my life except as a Muslim because I believed it was the truth, but I was just too weak to follow it. I felt that it was a near enough impossible task to leave everything that I was doing in order to, because from a non-Muslim's perspective looking in, Islam can seem restrictive. Mm. It can seem restrictive. But that, in you know, I come to realize later, that's due to the limitations of the person and not the, not the limitation of the religion. It's the limitation of the person's, you know, uh, mind and what's, what, what you can do with your life. You know, as, 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 a, as a young black boy growing up, you think of music. For those of us that may have been involved in, you know, that club and lifestyle and drugs and women, it's like, oh, I can't do everything that I know how to do. Some of us may have known how to do it well. Uh, so it can come across restrictive, but, you know, by the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything, everything is by the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, ultimately, um, you get, you, I began to realize that, no, it's, Islam isn't restrictive. In fact, you can do everything except for those things that are harmful for you. Um, now, when you look at uh, something like that, you start to see it from a completely different uh, light. So, so this, yeah, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to kind of probe you a little bit. So this is in the what the nineties, and in where is it in Brixton, or where where did you grow up? What kind of? No, this wasn't in the nineties, Sheikh. I became Muslim in um, two thousand and either four or six. six. Yeah, two thousand and four, two thousand six. About 15, 14, 15 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Good. And uh, London, which part of London? South East London, Catford. Okay. Yeah, I'm tempted to say um, 2004. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that was my, my introduction to uh, Al-Islam. And to be honest with you, I stopped eating pork. I stopped eating pork before I became a Muslim because it was, that was my way of just like <laughs> testing the waters. Not, not, not that I was a big pork eater anyway, but I, 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 I would consume pork. But um, it's like I stopped the pork and then I believe, Wallahu A'lam, I would have stopped things like alcohol. Other things I found harder to give up, but by the, like I said, by the tawfiq of Allah Taala, those things became a, a little bit more uh, easier. And uh, to this day, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, uh, I remember the, the, the day I took my shahada, I remember the, the whole day leading up to me taking the shahada at Maghrib, because we were approximately um, four days into Ramadan in 2004. And I was at college and I told all my friends, <laughs> I was in Lewisham College at the time, if you know where Lewisham College is. 
I uh, told all my friends, like, and all my friends were non-Muslims, smokers, drinkers, you know, girl, the, the, the normal for a non-Muslim. I said, no, today I'm going to become Muslim. Um, I don't remember anyone trying to detract me from it. It was more like, oh, okay. And I walked to literally Sheikh Yusuf from the college all the way to the masjid, which was Lewisham Masjid. And the walk felt like about half an hour, 40 minutes. I, as a young boy, I, don't, I, I never used to do stuff like that. I wouldn't walk that long. I'd just jump on a bus. Um, and I was just, you know, who knew, subhanAllah wa bihamdi, that that journey would be the, the beginning of a roller coaster that I was going to, um, you know, embark upon in terms of my, my time in uh, Al Medina, my time back in the UK, and everything that's happened as a result. And um, I walked into the masjid just as they were either going to start or finish in Maghrib, I forget. And it was strange. I was like, what? Well, there's no chairs. I walked in a building, there was no chairs. I couldn't, I couldn't understand, like, where do you sit down? Because usually when you gather together with people, there's places to sit down, there's tables, you know, and I just saw people, just carpet. I was like, okay. I remember a smell, that the Ramadan food type smell that was probably being, being cooked. And the chairs that were there were right at the back of the masjid. So I just sat there. And if you can try, even from right now, it's difficult because I've been, uh, learning Arabic for so long and teaching it, words now have meanings to me in Arabic, as they do to many of the Muslims. You say salam alaikum to somebody, it's almost as if you're speaking in English. Or if you say alhamdulillah, it's almost as if you're speaking in English. We use these words all the time. But for somebody that's never ever heard Arabic spoken before, you come in the masjid and you, you hear people seeming like they're singing. I'm talking about the recitation. It's a strange, it was a strange experience. But after that, you know, and you see all different types of people, you know, old people, young people, people from different nationalities and all of this, this is all information I'm soaking in at a time. It's like, I'm overwhelmed about what I'm about to do anyway. I know what I'm getting myself into. Well, at least I think I do anyway. And um, you see all of these different people and you say, well, it's not as strange as I thought because that, that guy over there, he just looks exactly like me, you know? Um, the imam took me to the, the beginning, the, the, the front of the masjid, and I was nervous. I was I'm, naturally, I'm a shy person anyway. I was even more shy back then. My confidence has come across leaps and bounds after becoming a Muslim. So he's got me at the front of this congregation with the microphone next to my mouth. I, I don't know what's going on. I, I know I'm going to take my shahada, but I thought it was going to be in a little room, just me, my dad, and the imam, maybe. I'm in front of the whole jama'ah, and you know that there was a lot of people there because it was time to break fast. And, um, he said, look, we're going to take the shahada. This is, uh, uh, ask my name, and say, this is Chris Bowman, his brother Isa's son. And as the imam was informing the congregation about, of, of about what's, um, concerning what's about to happen, I could only focus on my father and I saw him crying like a baby. And again, I still don't understand, like, why are you crying? Like, is it that serious about what I'm about? I obviously clearly didn't really understand the ramifications of what was about to happen. And for my father, who's, who had already been a Muslim for many years, he realized that this is potentially the, the difference between um, paradise and hellfire, potentially. I didn't know at the time that he was probably making dua constantly, you know, through Ramadan and these, for example, how many 10 days of Dhul Hijjah that he experienced, how, experience, how many um, uh, pot, potential Laylatul Qadr did he try, did he potentially catch? He was probably asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for someone in his family to be guided. So for him at that time, my reversion or conversion, whatever you want to say, was probably a, a, a sign that Allah answered his dua. That was probably, you know, emphasis that Allah does exist and Allah does answer the dua of the believers. But for me, I was just kind of just going along with how I felt. I didn't realize the significance. And um, by the time I finished the shahada, my dad was in tears, crying like a baby. So that was my introduction to um, Al-Islam in a nutshell. Yeah, mashallah. That's, um, just reminded me of a, a brother that he was, I think, from West Indies. I visited him yesterday, mm. a friend of mine at uni. And um, subhanAllah, you know what? He was one of those guys who wanted to be a perfectionist. So I remember a whole year he would pray with us. We'll do Ramadan and do a lot of things, but he wouldn't take the shahada. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that was, for me, it was kind of strange. And some of the other brothers saying, no, it's not going to count. And they were kind of said, look, leave him, let him. And he was, you know, he wasn't young, he was in his 30s. 
Yeah. Um, beautiful brother, you know, I met him and uh, alhamdulillah, eventually took it. It's beautiful. But he was just kind of, the, you know, the shaitan was kind of in and out asking him in, and he just says, no, no, I've got to learn a bit more. I've got to do a bit, few more prayers. I've got to get a few more fasting. Yeah. MashaAllah, you know, very strong these days. He's, um, uh, you know, married and he's got children and MashaAllah, so he's brought back those memories and that was in the 1995 to 99. That's when I was at uni, so. SubhanAllah. Yeah. May Allah bless the brother. I think as well, I think psychologically, if you know what you're going to do and you deep down you want to do it properly, but you just, you de also know yourself that you're still doing these things, you don't want to, you don't want to feel fake. You feel like you're being disingenuous um, or you're, you know, you're letting yourself down by not committing. And I think that's what puts a lot of people off. Uh, but the reality is that there's never going to be a perfect time. You're never going to be in a perfect state where you're sinless, you know, even as a Muslim now, uh, which Muslims free from sin, you know? Um, so uh, I think it's once you get over that, 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 that mindset as well, on top of obviously the waswas of the shaitan, but I think a lot of it's to do with uh, the mindset moving forward. People don't feel that they're how they should be 100%, but you know, alhamdulillah. Mashallah. And do you remember who the Imam was there at Lewisham at that time? Indeed, it was Imam Shakil. Oh, it was Imam Shakil. Wow. Imam Shakil. Legend, legend. I remember I met him, um, uh, I think last year we did an Imam's training um, at their um, center. And we caught up and, you know, Mashallah, that community is thriving uh, because of, uh, you know, Sheikh's uh, outstanding outreach. Um, fantastic. You know, may Allah preserve him and bless him with all the Ameen, ya amazing work he does. Um, he done my shahada, he done my marriage, he he done my sister's marriage, he done my mother's shahada. He's played a significant role in, you know, the Beaumont family life. Mashallah. Right. Good stuff. Right now, the people have been waiting for, I think, your journey. Let's see how it starts. You know, how, how do you kind of fall into this Medina? You know, what, what happened after you, you took the shahada? What do you want to do with your life? You know, it's like a new page, new yeah. era. For sure. I mean, I, you know, I wish I could tell you I had a fairy tale um, conversion where I, I became a Muslim and, and I, you know, I was on it from the, the jump. But that's just not the reality of my story. Um, I did try, uh, but obviously I'm still battling with however many years of Al Jahiliya and my old friends. And these things take time to kind of leave your system. And it's quite a natural progression, you know. Um, and I, I would like for anybody that is listening, no matter if you've been a Muslim a couple of months or a couple of years, you know, at the end of the day, you can only try your best and you can't get to the point where you beat yourself up about it. Otherwise, that could potentially go down a slippery slope, a slippery slope, sorry, to depression, you know, and now you start to despair in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you just feel you're no good. Um, and again, that there, Sheikh Yusuf, in my humble opinion, it comes down to uh, perspective and how you choose to look at a particular situation anyway i digress um like i mentioned at the beginning somebody would have told me about al medina going to apply um and for any student male student that wants to apply one of the, the things that they have to do is get a um, recommendation tazkiyat from uh, an authority or a recognized body so i remember in the early days trying to sort all of that out going to different imam again imam shakil Right, gave me a tazkiyah. So you can imagine for him, from seeing me take my shahada, from marrying me to my wife, who alhamdulillah I'm still married to this day, to writing me a tazkiyah, this gentleman, like him or hate him, he's, got, he's played a significant role in my life. And for that reason, I have to always appreciate that in him and respect him for that and love him for that. You with me? So he wrote me the tazkiyah uh, among, uh, among other people as well. When I went for to apply because in the back back in the day we didn't have, have what they have now do it online i had you had to go there and you had to sit down and you had to have uh, an interview so i initially you know arranged uh, with a brother in east london to go for umrah i had uh, i was by myself no real knowledge of the arabic language and the brother looked after me when we got to mecca but once i got to medina there was a student that i already knew um and it was, it was as simple as that. I went to the admissions department. You know, I said, I'm here for an interview. I had obviously help. Um, sat down, had the, the interview. And to be honest with you, at the, by the time the interview finished, I couldn't tell you whether uh, heads or tails, whether I was going to get in or, or not, because I still can't speak Arabic. But 
I do remember the gentleman saying, inshallah khair, inshallah khair. You know, he asked me questions like, um, oh gosh, what was the first battle in Al-Islam? Um, that's the only question I remember actually, but it, was, it wasn't that long. Lo and behold, the trip came to an end, came back to the UK. And I believe I had my, even my wife was pregnant at the time, or we might have had our first child. And the year that I applied to get in, I didn't get in Sheikh Yusuf, and I was absolutely devastated. I was like, oh, okay. I tried. It's not for me. And at this time, I was just finishing my last year at uni. So it's like a crucial, a pivotal point in my life. Where do I go now? Um, and I, I knew I wanted to get to Saudi by hook or by crook. But because the, um, the apply, you know, applying to become a student didn't work, I was like, well, what's, what's the next best thing I can do and how do I do it? And I found out that, look, if you get a CELTA coupled with a degree and you get some experience, you're good to go. You can make some good money, tax-free, living. I, I was sold the dream. And that's exactly what me and my wife did, Sheikh Yusuf. From uni, my last year in uni, we actually went back to Lewisham College, which was the college that I went to prior to going to university. Me and my wife went there. We did the three-month intense, semi-intensive uh, CELTA. And before you knew it, uh, uh, I call him Uncle Abdul Haq Baker. He was already established in Jeddah at the time. He, he's known my family for donkey's years. He eventually ended up offering me, offering me a job. So I did the CELTA. And whilst I was doing the CELTA simultaneously, because it was a part-time course, I was also working. So I was able to try to implement what I was learning at the CELTA at work and I remember one day I was walking to work in Brixton I parked my car about five minutes ten minutes walk from the, my, my destination and as I was walking I saw Abdul Haq Baker I didn't even know that he was in the country I didn't even know he was in the country he was just parked up in his car so I was like oh assalamu alaikum how are you doing so he's like how's how's how's, how's the CELTA going because he he's the one who advised me to do it I said yes yeah, coming it's, it's going good we're coming to an end I should be finished in like a couple of days or a week or so he says, okay, I'm going to tentatively offer you a job. Sheikh Yusuf, it was the first time in my life I ever heard the word tentatively. I just knew what it meant from the context. To this day, I use it, the word tentative or tentatively, based on that meeting I had with Abdul Haq Baker over 11 years ago. And I started, in the middle of Brixton, I started crying because I, I couldn't believe that. It was just like, just like that, I'm going to get a job. And lo and behold, I eventually went to work for Abdul Haq in Jeddah. So the year I wanted to become a student, I didn't get in, I ended up going to Jeddah. I went there for Allah, as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for me to, to go. And it was, it was beautiful because I was working, I was making money. My wife and my daughter were with me at the time. Life was good and I could study Arabic in my own time. I, had, I was in Jeddah 40 minutes, 45 minutes from Mecca. Life was fantastic. What happened though, Sheikh Yusuf was, um, and I'm sure you know anyone that's seen any of my interviews before will know, uh, one of my children uh, was diagnosed with Down syndrome. So whilst my wife was with me in Jeddah, in fact, the day, the day before or so that she came out to Jeddah, she had the five-month scan, wherein they told her that the baby's going to have Down syndrome. She came anyway, and then uh, Abdul Haq Baker, Uncle Abdul Haq Baker said, listen, I know how much you want to stay here. I know, I know what you've done to get here, but you're going to have to go back to the UK and be with your wife because she's going to need you. And again, I'm young, I think I'm 22 at the time. Like I'm 35 now, so I'm a completely different person, but I'm young at the time. Obviously I wanna be there for my wife, but I've also just started my life. And I was torn, I didn't know what to do, but I took his advice and I went back. Would you believe it was when I was back in Medina, sorry, back in London, Abdul Haq had another project happening in London. So he's like, I went from a job to a job. He said, don't worry, when you go back to, um, uh, when you go back to, to London, I'm going to put you on a 20 grand a, a 20 grand a year salary. And as a 21, 22 year old uh, young guy, it was, it, was, it was nice. I think it ended up working out to be 18,000, but I was appreciative that of the opportunity because many people don't get the opportunity. I went from one job to another job. And um, I vividly remember one day I was sitting in uh, the office of the, the, uh, the company that we were working for and a gentleman walked in, a Muslim, one of the brothers from the community, and he said, uh, Ismail, what's, what's, your, what's your birth name? I said, oh, Chris. Um, he said, oh, you've been accepted to the University of Medina. I said, oh, whatever. Because I had applied two years prior 
He said, I'm not joking. I said, maybe it's some other Christopher Beaumont. It's not as if I've got some unique name. Beaumont isn't the most unique surname and Christopher sure isn't the most unique name in the world. He said, no, 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 it's you. So I said, no, you have to show me. So I saw my name. Even by looking at my name, Sheikh, I still wasn't convinced it was me. I was like, maybe there's some white brother from, I don't know, Manchester or another place. That is him. Um, coincidentally, around the same time, a cousin of my wife was going for Umrah, a brother. So, and he wanted to apply for the Jamia. So I said, Achi, do me a favor, please. And this was the days of Blackberry Messenger, if you remember those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blackberry Messenger. I remember, man. He said, I said to him, Achi, look, when you go to apply, say that a brother called so-and-so has been accepted. Just see if you can see anything. A picture, my dress, anything that I would have submitted for you to know that it's me. Uh, sometime later, I don't know if it was hours or days later, he says, Achi, it's you. I said, how do you know? He said, I saw your mugshot. And you know, when you apply, you have to do the passport photo. And I've got the passport photo to this day. Wow. I've got, the, I've, I've got the, 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 the sheet of paper to this day somewhere lurking around. Um, and that's when it finally sunk in that I got accepted to the University of Medina. Before then, it, it hadn't sunk in, you know. And, um, you know, lo and behold, I had to do every. There's a lot of running around that you had to do, medicals and stuff like that. But lo and behold, I, you know, I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was well on my way to um, pursuing my dream of studying in the Islamic University of Al Medina, becoming a student there. Yeah, mashallah, man, that's, that's pretty awesome. You know, Allah Subhanahu Taala has had that plan written for you, but you had to go through this kind of for sure, yeah, traversing and and some similar things for me when I left in two thousand and eight. Uh, I made intention that I wanted to study the deen in whatever capacity I could someday to get to Medina. I didn't know when, I didn't know what, I didn't know how, I just made that intention. And I set up with some friends, a company, went to Riyadh, uh, 2008 we're talking about, you know, and we're stationed there for a good few years. Before that was in Emirates actually for about a year. Mm. And then 2008, nine, 10, you know, I'm in Riyadh, I'm not really benefiting any from the scholars or anything. I was just busy with work and life and settling. And then, you know, in, it's 2012 when things change. And in this SOTA, for those who are not familiar, this is English language teaching. And so after a few years of setting up the company, we start struggling, you know, money dries up. And I'm thinking, okay, right, now it's crunch time. What do I do? Come back home. You know, I had family with me at that time, one or two children at that time only. I've got six now, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, and I thought, okay, I've done a few years. But it's, you know, either I throw it in, come back to England, uh, but I had nothing here because I've left my job, everything, or mm. I keep struggling and fighting out. And I thought, no, I'm going to do a, go into another career, do some maybe uh, teaching and, you know, d did some summer course and I thought, I'm going to teach some English. Beautiful. And then that's how I get into King Saud University in 2008 or nine, mm. uh, do some teaching and still running the company in the background for a few years. And that hope and intention, I never gave up. I knew I was going to go, but it was a time when Allah would invite me. And then in 2012, subhanAllah, there's this kind of bogus, it felt like a bogus company from Jordan. You know, they said, oh, we were opening new massive university programs, English language in Medina. I'm thinking, nah, you guys are having a joke, isn't it? Um, it came through like a con connect connection of my wife's. And I thought, nah, the guy calls me up and he goes, no, I want to offer you some. I thought maybe just a teacher. He goes, oh, we want to offer you like a director, you know, program director. I'm thinking, well, what's going on here? You know, and... Um, that is it. That was a transformation. And this is in 2012. Uh, subhanAllah, you know, and then that's how it starts. And then, alhamdulillah, I spent six whole years uh, working, studying and doing a little bit of teaching, you know, inside Masjid Nabawi and running the, uh, as you probably know, the, some of the outreach programs, chaplaincy. Um, so that's kind of a snapshot. But it, it was just, I think the key was having that intention, having that hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will make it happen. Um, but never to give up, you know, the, the long journey was long. I mean, Emirates, Riyadh, almost coming back to Bristol. This is where my hometown is. Mm. And then beyond my wildest dreams, you know, not just a teacher, but you go in as a program manager to run. And not only that, then they eventually told me Islamic University. I said, what are you talking about? Islamic University, Sharia. What planet are you guys on? You know, what's going on here? They didn't do anything other than uh, Sharia and Quran. 
when it was that royal decree at that time, you know, they decided to open the scientific colleges. Um, and we were on the main campus at that time, if you remember the old buildings. Yes, 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 indeed. Yeah, so we, we launched there. They, they, we used some of these old classrooms for a whole year yeah. until yeah. they, you know, they moved us up to the new big nice one. Like the campus, like, like you know. The luxurious um, buildings. Huh? The luxurious buildings. Yeah, yeah, the luxurious. Um, but subhanAllah, yeah, it was just still, it was kind of uh, surreal, really, of how it kind of happens. Um, and then everything else, you know, in terms of the, the, the Mashinabawi stuff and these things were another story. Sheikh Yusuf, um, you know what's beautiful yeah. about that story is that that one phone call has changed your life. Mm. Imagine if you missed that phone call, Allah must stand. And another beautiful thing about listening to your story is that, um, you know, it's just, it's just a reminder just to trust in the process. You know, trust as well as being obviously uh, keeping the intention alive and never giving up and, you know, being having good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just trust in the process. At the end of the day, how you get to al Medina is not your choice. You know, inshallah ta'ala, you're going to get there how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to get there. And what better, as a brother said to me the other day, what better will is there to prefer the will of somebody who's deficient and makes mistakes or the will of the one that's free from mistakes? You know, so it's beautiful to hear that, you know. Sometimes we want something and it doesn't happen the way we want it or maybe anticipate it to happen. And how it does end up happening is like in my wildest dream, I would never expect the company from Jordan to just call up or connect to with me through my wife and then end up offering me this prestigious uh, position in the Islam. It's beautiful, man. And it's, it's, it's just like, imagine Sheikh Yusuf, right? Remember at the, at, the, at the time when he was in the Riyadh, when money was drying up, you might have been a bit stressed. You were like at a crossroads. Do I stay? Do I go? Am I coming or I'm, I'm sure you probably had other stresses of life as well, you know, family issues, friends, whatever. Um, but if you just knew, if you knew 100%, like somebody told you, don't worry, in a year's time, you're going to be the director of your whole outlook on life and every, the test would have been completely different. And I try, even with my journey now with cancer, Sheikh Yusuf, I try to say to myself, look, Allah's never, ever let us down. He's never, ever let us down. So instead of waiting six months or a year to get the good news or to get that thing that you wanted, act, act as if you're, it's already happened. And start, you know, living your life with the gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if that thing has already happened. And it, co it kind of coincides with the statement of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, where when he told the companions, Allah wa antum bil ijaba. Call upon Allah whilst you're certain that he will answer your, your request or your supplication. And if you were to ask anyone, Shaykh Yusuf, how do you feel, what emotion do you feel when Allah wa ta'ala answers a request? The probably, probably the number one answer that you'll get back from them. In fact, let me ask you the question. Let me see if my, my theory um, uh, pans out. All right. There's something that you want more than anything in the world, Shaykh Yusuf, and you've been calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night for this thing, and then suddenly you get it. What's the first emotion that you're going to feel for the situation that's presented itself to you? Towards a lot, obviously. It's gratitude, isn't that's it? That's the one right there. That is it. Gratitude. Everyone's going to say gratitude. You're going to be grateful. So my thing is, when the Prophet ﷺ was teaching his companions to be basically be grateful, when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, live your life in a state of gratitude because if somebody's certain that their supplication is going to be answered, that necessitates that they, the gratitude is going to follow. But the Prophet Ali is saying, be grateful, even if it hasn't happened, be grateful, live your life in a state of gratitude. And that's what I try to do. I try to live my life. I don't always succeed, Sheikh Yusuf. I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a human being. So yeah, I, everyone, all of us, we have our flaws. But I, I just find that so beautiful if a person, no matter what they're going through, financial hardships, health hardships, marital hardships be in a state of gratitude for as long as you can to the best of your ability because that will effectively shape how you look at a situation and also how you feel yeah alhamdulillah zakallah khair for that reminder um yeah we've still got around 45 minutes um let's get stuck into let's say then let's do some you know life in medina because this is what a lot of our brothers and sisters have tuned in to see, you know, what we got up to. 
what kind of um, food we're eating, what kind of, uh, you know, madness that we got involved in. <laughs> so, but, you know, so a lot of different experiences. I And I met you kind of towards the end, I think, of my era, a couple of... Yeah, yeah. that's fair to say. That's fair to say. Um, yeah, so get, how when you arrived there, landed there, you know, and um, you're yeah. ready, you're settling in on campus and you're... Yeah. Uh, meeting, you know, and you'll just kind of, I'll share with you a bit of my first ever incident. It was amazing. Okay. I'm in okay. there. Okay. So we're, you, you dream that it's like, you know, everything is amazing and we're there and I'm going down and this is my first um, time in Medina and I'm on the escalators going down, you know, the escalator down to the toilets and I'm coming yeah. up actually and I get a little tap on my shoulder uh, and I turn around and there's a little young lad and he smiles and he greets me you know says welcome to Medina and I never forget this to this day you know he doesn't know who I am I don't know who he is I'm just coming back from Wudu but he just welcomes me as if he knew that I'm coming and I'm a guest to his city and to this day I, I can't you know I don't forget it it's, that was beautiful. my entrance the beautiful, beautiful you know alhamdulillah beautiful. so yeah with regards to my um um experience when I first arrived in Al Medina um the day that I, I left the airport, there were a few students with us. I wasn't by myself. Uh, and we had arranged with like the uh, representative of the British students to collect us at the airport and stuff like that. When I, when I first got there, you can imagine it's a dream come true. I'm still quite, you know, on a spiritual high, really excited. But I remember my mind's telling me it was the first night. My mind's telling me it's the first night. Maybe it wasn't, but there was definitely a time where my, it wasn't my Iman as such, but the novelty went like this, whoosh, it just plummeted. And I was, I felt, I felt conflicted. I'm like, why, why am I feeling like this? And what the react, what it was, was that me personally, I was missing my family. It was as much as I wanted to be in the, the blessed city of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and have this opportunity it's, it's really strange how, you know, human beings, the, the way we are, the way we interact with our emotions, that novelty can just wear off. And I would have, alhamdulillah, I didn't, but I would have left to go back home because I just wanted to be with my, my missus. Um, I, I, I suppose one of the things that really helped me was that there were brothers that I knew over there that were, you know, had been there longer and basically were holding me down. You know, until once you get like a week in, two weeks in, the the amount of the amount of um that that how much you miss people back home, it starts to get a bit easier when you realize oh, I've got internet or I can. Uh, at the time, I was rinsing Skype, WhatsApp, and that weren't out yet. So um, that was my initial um, you know introduction to Al Medina. And remember, I'm going to have a significantly different experience to you because I'm going as a, a talib. You're going as a, a businessman or a director. So I'm living in the student accommodations. You're probably getting, you know, your house on Sharit Sultana with three, four bathrooms and stuff like that. The first room that they put me in, Sheikh Yusuf, I had to share with six people. Wow. No partitions. And they put me in the second oldest building in the uni. Whereas my friend that Kate got, got accepted the year before, if you remember Abdul Hakim Fingers, they put him in building number 14. Building number 14 were the new builds. That was like the Marriott and the Hilton. <laughs> like we were in the hood where we were um, living. We, I was in Al-Wahda Al-Wahda the second building and there was no partitions. I'm coming here with my big suitcase and my laptop and all of these things. And I said to Abdul Hakim, listen, there's no way I'm staying in this room with my things out. The toilets were very challenging. Every, the smell, I saw cats walking around. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. It was all too much, you know, all too much. And I, alhamdulillah, I wasn't the only one that felt like that from the new students. And even Abdul Hakim, he's like, right, this is rough. Like, <laughs> it, it, they were, they hadn't even experienced what we were experiencing. But mashallah, the, the, the brother, may Allah bless him, man, he's got a big heart. He allowed us to sleep on the floor in his room until we got our own rooms. I ended up still staying in the old buildings, but it was only four to a room and the rooms were partitioned. So I had my own little section, which was nice, but it was still challenging, Sheikh Yusuf, as you can imagine. 
Some people want the AC on, others want the AC off. You know, some people like the light on, other people want the light off. Some people cook in their, their room and you might not like the smell of the, the food of their cultural dish, but you just have to put up with it. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 um, it was challenging to say. That was my introduction, Sheikh Yusuf to Al Medina. Yeah. So I just want to add on some points here because, you know, I spent a lot of time with a lot of Western students, giving them, you know, chilling out with them and then doing the leadership workshops that we used to do. Yeah. And, you know, subhanAllah, I remember the sacrifices. Average, correct me if I'm wrong, I think each mm -hmm. Medina student does about seven to eight years. You know, that's their sentence because you've got to do the two year Arabic that's diploma, right. you've got to do the four years bachelor's at six. Yes. Yeah, and then you're going to take some time out. You might miss a semester. So you're averaging seven, yes. eight years. And most of the boys I'm speaking to, you know, and a lot of them have left their wives, moms. Um, and some of the guys, you know, one American guy, I know, Palestinian bro, very sad. He had like about three semesters left. That's a year and a half left. Mm. And he quit. He couldn't wow. handle it. What are you, you know, sad. You know, shit, did, I mean, did he say that I quit because I can't handle it? I don't know what he said, but he just, he said, look, I want to get married. I want to move on with my life. I'm not uh, making any progress here. I, I can't do this anymore. Because and Sheikh, man just, it's difficult, Sheikh. It is so and, I, and I don't look, at first I got angry and upset, but then I thought, I do feel some of what he was going through because he's not the only one. You know that. Yes. I've seen loads of others over the years. The boys have not, you know, it's, um, it's kind of like the lifestyle that we have here. To the lifestyle there, the changes, the the emotions, the culture. You have to be, you know, and that's why I think even let's say the the the, the kid that comes out of Medina and he's one of the worst ones, subhanAllah. Let's say he didn't take much. He's still a giant, you know, he's a soldier because he's done that time. That's and it's it. not for everybody. Uh, and you've got to give him the respect, even if you don't respect anything about about him, that you have to give him because that's a lifetime he sacrificed for Allah's path and he gave up on life Sheikh Allah, I yeah? totally concur with you you know some of the issues that we had in Medina with um, other brothers and whatnot one thing I can't take away for all of our differences if you managed to get to Medina and you tried I take my, my, my coffee off to you even if you didn't graduate because it's not all about graduation what it's about is the sincerity of the action the paper doesn't mean anything you know it really doesn't um so it's uh if you manage to go there and complete then you you have to you can't you, you can't do anything but just respect the talab i.e his quest for knowledge because bilal shaykh without a shadow of a doubt he would have gone through some serious hardships multiple times sheikh yusuf i wanted to to leave if it was sometimes I, if it wasn't for sheikh taher white you know one time i came to him and i was having a serious situation and I told it, I told it to him, and I'm a very private person, Sheikh. You know what he said to me? And this this one kalima just changed everything. He said, Man, at the end of the day, you're gonna do what you're going to do. But you, meaning me, he said, You're not like other brothers. You 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 haven't just come here just for the ride and you've come here and I basically he was I can't remember the exact words he was he, he said, but he saw something, whatever that was in me, and it was that belief that somebody that I respect and love and look up to dearly saying to me or believing in me made me say, no, you know, I can do this. And again, what is that? Perspective. And it all comes down to how a person chooses to look at a situation. I was on the brink of giving it up. That, that Palestinian American brother, I've been there, Sheikh Yusuf, where it's like, I don't care anymore. I want to go home, you know, and that is a sad state. but. You know, ultimately, every every experience you go through in life, it does make you stronger if you learn from those experiences. If you learn from those experiences. Yeah. All right. Listen, it's good what we're discussing now. We've got some couple of questions that come in very relevant to what the topic we're on. One of them is the challenges. So we're going through them. Uh, another one said, how do students initially manage getting on with everyday life, not being able to speak Arabic? Yeah. It's a, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. <laughs> uh, I, you know what, Sheikh? My, my only stuff, <laughs> maybe I should say a nightmare. But my thing is, I, I, I think it's a disservice if I were to come here and say, oh, it was amazing, you know, the, 
the teachers are so helpful and you know the students are great and the, it wasn't like that or well, at least that wasn't my experience um going to al medina starting from in the arabic institute in al mustawa al awwal um if you go there with zero arabic you can't distinguish alif from ya you're going to struggle because Oftentimes what happens, and I was a bit guilty of this myself, people who start in Mustawa al Awal are people that can speak Arabic, can have a fluent conversation. So now if you're an Alif Ba'ata student, you're, you're immediately at disadvantage. And we had some Egyptian teachers, as great as they were, I don't think they understood this delicacy here because if the teacher explains a rule and then the teacher says, Hal fahim tum? All right, and then the Aqwiya from the Tulab say, Naam, fahimna ya Sheikh. He's moving on to the next point. The one that don't even know what the sheikh said, he's gonna, he's just, he's just looking around. And that was me for the very first semester. I'm like, I don't really understand what's going on. But because I exposed myself to Arabic prior to going to Jeddah, and whilst I was in Jeddah, I was at a slight advantage uh, compared to other students. There were other students that I know, uh, Sheikh Yusuf, Jamaican students that got in the same time as me. Alhamdulillah, I completed the ma'ad in two years in the designated time. It took them four or three or maybe mm -hmm. more. And it's not that they're silly. It's just yeah. that I had a head start. It's like, it's like everything in life. You know, nobody's really stupid or anything like that. It's uh, people have head starts in life, you know? Um, as it relates to getting around and like when you have your, you know, your missions that you have to deal with inside the uni, oftentimes you're gonna have a brother with you that can probably speak Arabic that will help you out. That was a, a tremendous help. Um, other than that, the, the learning process was really, really frustrating. Can you imagine sitting for like four hours or five hours a day and somebody speaking, you're hot, you're hungry. I mean, I, I got there when I was uh, 25 and I'm in a class with 17, 18 year olds and I, I don't really know what's going on. I got, I got, I got two children at home. And you can imagine where my mind was half the time, you know, it's frustrating, but, but I can only, you know, thank Allah and just glorify him and extol his mention for giving me the ability, granting me the success not to give up. No yeah. disrespect to anybody that felt that that was their only option, but it was one of the best things that I ever did in my whole entire life, Sheikh Yusuf, because I learned things in Al Medina that has helped me to this day, especially with my journey with cancer. You know, it's, a, it's, um, it's, it's, the, it's the connection, not saying I've got the, the, the closest connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you know, there's, there's, there's something about um, for, like trying to develop anyway, a strong um, a creed, a strong creed, your aqeedah, and your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will allow you to withstand tests and trials and tribulations. Certain trials and tribulations that other people might not be able to withstand, but it was the knowledge that I was able to receive whilst I was there that helped me stay grounded through my, my darkest times, Sheikh Yusuf. And I'm talking about really, really, really dark times. Yeah, no, I think we've got to, you know, take advantage of every situation. I remember what you're saying because, you know, I'm there as kind of a program director and they're rolling me out into different meetings. Now, my Arabic at that time, mm. I don't know that because I spent a few years in Riyadh at that time, maybe barely three, four years. Yeah. Yes, I'm sitting in two, three hour meeting, they're just yapping away, man. They're just, well, you know what I'm doing? I'm like a machine just observing the same frequency of words, what situation, you know, why the guy's saying it, how he responds. Yeah, and I'm registering but I'm barely understanding, you know, meetings, meetings, meetings. Yeah, and after I remember as well going into the Masjid Nabawi, sitting in some halakat and I'm sitting there and I would barely, the first halakat I would sit, I would barely get maybe 10% of what the Sheikh is saying, but I'm sitting there. Yeah. I'm enjoying the atmosphere, you know, the things that I've studied in English, when that hadith, there's a bit of, you know, resemblance. I know the key words, yeah, so I'm yes. buzzing with a few words, salah, <laughs> zakah, yeah. But the, you know, the persistency of fighting on year on year, my 10% is going up to 20, 30, 40. Yeah. And subhanAllah, you know, by the time I left, I will sit there and I'm there 90%. It's like a English. It's like English. Yeah, the halakas are there. And it's like, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm in my comfort zone. But look at the journey. It's taken five, six years 
of sitting and being exposed to the language. That's, That's the next question they're saying is, how long did it take you to become fluent in Arabic? We've got another related question. Yeah, I mean, respectfully, I'm very still, I'm, I'm very much learning the language. Yeah, I know I do teach it um, and I love teaching it, but I'm still learning the language. Um, that question for me, Sheikh, is quite difficult to answer because everyone may have a different uh, definition of what fluent is. You know, if an Arab heard me speak today, maybe he wouldn't say I'm fluent. If somebody that don't really speak Arabic that much or can speak it to a mediocre uh, standard, they might think, oh, I am fluent. So it's quite um, uh, subjective. But needless to say, needless to say, I don't think the ma'had in and of itself right was enough to prepare you for example to for kulia it just simply wasn't sheikh yusuf you know in order to gain mastery of any language you need to do your speaking your listening your reading and your writing you have to focus on those core skills and man as a shadid i didn't feel that the mahad was set up to equip the student to adequately focus on each of these skills um and allah knows best uh, maybe that's uh, an unfair statement but i mean i'm not the only one that feels like that um, to answer the question, it's diff like, I, like I said, it's difficult to say how long it was, but one thing that I can say, and I remember very well, is my relentless desire, as you had that earlier on when you spoke about your desire to come to Al Medina, I had a relentless desire to learn this language. Like, my thing was only deaf, Sheikh Yusuf was going to stop me from learning this language. And I suppose that if anybody, no matter what, um, wh whatever your endeavor is, whether it's to be a, uh, to learn Arabic or to be a student of knowledge or whatever you want to, whatever field you want to go into, if you have a unshaken desire such that you say only death is going to stop me from getting or reaching my destination, or that's at least that's your attitude and that's how you approach the situation, you're definitely going to do it. It doesn't matter if it takes you a year, one year, two years. It's not important. Again, when you reach the destination, it's not important. It's about the sincerity of the intention. So when I get asked this question, my response is just enjoy the process. Don't focus on how long it's going to take. Because if I say to you guys, oh, it took me one year and you've been studying Arabic for four years, how's that going to make you feel? It's not important. It's not important. It's, it's, it's focused on the sincerity of the, 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 the intention. And just enjoy what you're doing because one day it's going to happen it's a given it's going to happen and you're going to look back and then you're going to you know you, you're going to laugh at yourself at some of the times you you struggle to di differentiate the bar from the tar you know or uh, the, 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 the the sheen from the scene and stuff like that so that's what i would say to that i hope that um, answers the question yeah no no i think the key thing where I'll, i concur with you is the you know, how badly do you want something? And this is what we do when it comes to, you know, motivation and this leadership stuff. You know, that, that's kind of my game. Mashallah. It's like, um, you know, when you want to, how badly do you want something? Because there are a lot of people, they don't want it badly enough. And that's why it doesn't happen. Like you said, if it's, it's death or nothing, that's it. you're going to get it. But if you're very half-hearted, uh, most likely it's not going to happen because you don't want it. As soon as you, the first excuse you find, you just think, oh, all right, I'm giving up can't do this that's it and that's, that's the difference between commitment and interest are you yeah. interested in studying or are you committed to studying absolutely um yeah it's a it is a long process you know it's a, you've got to be in there for the long run that's for it. me the Maya Arabic is very poor let's put it that way but you know the Amiya stuff the stuff with the, the uh, you know i developed a lot in that but it kind of took years because everyone keeps asking me so you, you you're talking just like the bedouins and you're wearing this scarf they can't even tell if you're shamrani or because you know one time i went into king Saud, another yeah. teacher's class and i'm dressed like this and then he's an egyptian teacher good friend of mine he goes there's uh yusuf's here uh study yusuf so which tribe is he from guys have a vote and they're all voting you know they said no he's yeah he's uh, what do you call it shamrani uh, he's a harbi and the other guys said no he's harbi look at his eyes this time you know and then i speak a few words in their dialect you know the Ammiya of the, the uh, hijazis uh, or the riyadh you know najdis and they yeah. say they we told you uh, he speaks like the harbis uh, you know, it takes wow. time that's the, it takes that's time the. but it, it's that, it was that passion and that love that i said I, I need to mix with these and the immersion as you and i know as language teachers 
you know, mixing and immersing with the language. A lot of the Brits isolate themselves. They stay with the Brits enclaves and the, what do you call it, compounds, and they hardly see a Saudi or Arabs. And, you know, you're not exposed to the language. So uh, true. So you're true. not going to benefit from it. So the next question from here, one of the sisters asking, um, what is it life in Medina for the wives uh, and families uh, of the students? Do they have a chance, a support network? Can they study? What are their challenges um, when they're there? You know, some, alhamdulillah, Allah gives them the chance to take them. Others, they don't go because they're not, you know, they don't have financial or they don't have a visa means. So what can yeah. you uh, enlighten on that for family experiences and what they have, what they can get up to, what they can study? The ladies, if they can study Arabic, Islamic studies. Yeah. Sheikh, I feel bad, man, because I feel like in my transparency, I don't want to turn anyone away from Al Medina, but I can only just be honest. I mean, you have to understand, the, 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 try to understand this. The majority of our wives that follow us to Al Medina, they're following our dream. Yes, they benefit. Yes, they are probably ecstatic that they're going to be in the, the best city of Al Medina. But that last spot for so long, every ni'mah that we've been given, the, 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 the appreciation and the gratitude last but for so long. And then what happens? You start, the no, like I said, the novelty wears off. So if you can imagine if a, a sister comes over to Al Medina, whether she's got children or not, the majority of the time she's in the house. She's in the house. And especially for us, I, I can't speak on behalf of a, um, the wife of a, an expat, expat who works. But as a, a talib, don't have much money, you know, um, studying. And if you're struggling, you're going to have to, and, you, and, and you're hungry for it, Sheikh Yusuf, you're going to be putting the time in outside, homework and stuff like that. And if you're trying to benefit from the ulama, as you know, the, the, the rules of the ulama are always in the evening. So there is definitely that element which is very, very difficult because, you know, obviously the woman wants company with, of, of, of a husband, but the husband's trying to pursue seeking knowledge. It is not easy, you know. Um, this is why the reward for seeking knowledge is so great. All right, they make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the path easy for that individual to get to Jannah. Having said that, that's in the like the initial stage when you're setting up and stuff. There does get to a stage now where you know the, uh, the, you know, the wives they get into their grooves, they meet other sisters. Um, if there are um istarahat, you know, when you get there's an istiraha where there's gonna be a sheikh giving a talk and brothers are gonna have some food. It's an excellent time for brothers, uh, sorry, sisters to get together and meet other Westerners and say, oh, I'm not alone. And I think at that stage, that's when the, 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 the normality of living in Medina kicks in because you start to build up a community of friends, which you may not see all the time, but there is a community uh, needless to say. Uh, with regards to studying Arabic and stuff like that, when I got to Al Medina, there was talks, and this was like, what, uh, 11 years ago now? There were talks that they were going to open up a sister side back then. I'd, I've never seen it. I don't think it will ever happen. Um, but if you're in Medina as a wife of a talib, then there are definitely um, institutes where you can study Arabic, whether you do it uh, privately or whether you do it in a, a proper institute. So it's... Um, it, 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 it's definitely available and feasible, but again, you have to want it more than you want food and drink. And, you know, there are, there is, sorry, a lot of responsibility on the, the shoulders of our wives in Medina uh, for, for a student. They have to put up with a lot, you know, and if, you, if your experience was anything like mine, where I had children and I had real, real issues in Medina, you bring that home. You with me? You bring those issues home, and who who else? Who else are you going to unload your, your problems on? Uh, except obviously after Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But you know, everyone we need a companion to speak to your wife. So um, I would say in the beginning stage it can be quite lonely. You know, I do remember my wife in the early stages being very clingy uh, to me. Um, that slowly subsided as she started to get her own community, um, and we were you know blessed as a family because wherever we were in Jeddah. Or in Al Medina, she was always blessed to get work because, like myself, Sheikh Yusuf, she had a degree of certain experience, and that was a tremendous uh, blessing because it opens doors. You know, having being qualified, having education, it opens doors. So, 
once she started to have her own routine and her regime, that was uh, definitely a, a, a tremendous blessing, you know? Yeah, I think, look, I agree with you. Look, even for those who work, um, you know, your priority, of, of course, is your duty. So even for me, working long days and then going home and then sometimes, you know, just spending an hour. I remember some days, half an hour, you know, I'd go home, mm. something, mm. and then I'm out, off to the Sheikh's Dars because, That's you know, it. we committed once a week. That's it. And they just see you for 45 minutes, you come back home and, you know, it's, it's yeah. difficult. Yeah, so they, they they have to put up with that. But like you said, once you get used to that, once it's done, because, you know, there's places, as you know, the, the wives can study during the yeah. day. Yes. Um, there's my, there's the Dawa centers, the uh, Marrakesh, even in Medina, you know, where they used to have some nice guest lectures come in in English. Yeah. Um, and the Astarahas, you know, the once a week, once a month with the, with the pool, where the kids can play around. Um, you know, these were something amazing to look forward to but you got to fight that initial a few years you know the first few years are rocky yes and this is the, the access. if you can't pass that and stay together it's not you know you, you're not going to feel the benefit and then of course with, you know, even for the students maybe less but for those who work alhamdulillah you get you know maybe once every two three months you say okay that's it man this weekend we're going makkah Yes. Yeah. Yep. And that's yep. you know that's prices. You wait that three months. You don't care. Everyone is just now counting down, waiting for yep. that Makkah trip, and that it's worth it. You you're gonna you live that two yep. months, you know. And we used to sometimes, Panla, there was a center in Jeddah where I used to do khutbah sometimes on a Friday. So yep. we'd head out Friday morning after Fajr, do the mm. Jum'ah there to an English center, English audience, then go to the seaside, and then go to Makkah then stay and head back, you know, and that, that three months would be worth it. They will be patient on that, you know, yeah, do the yeah. work, whatever it needs, because, you yeah. know, we, we've got something amazing to look forward to. You've got to plan things. Um, and also, you know, the eight times where we have this, that has and these things, and also um, uh, the theme parks or the shopping malls that, you know, if you go on the weekends, all uh, shopping malls have a, like a mini fun fair on the top. The kids That's can it. go on rides, you know, and these are beautiful where you take yeah. the family uh, yeah. on a Friday or Saturday, you know, and this is priceless because they'll yeah. wait the whole, yeah. week. you know, the family will sacrifice the whole your weeks, evening, because they know this is, this is work time. This is Islam oh, right. time. Yeah. You're waiting, they're counting down for the Friday night, Thursday night. And then, you know, we're uh, letting down detoxing, de-stressing. And then the, you know, the, the, again, it starts again. So you've got these phases, you know, so Alhamdulillah, I think it's a mix. Yeah, you're right. You reminded me, Sheikh Yusuf, man. There was definitely some some beautiful times. Even being being there, in, like on the first day of Ramadan, praying Taraweeh in the Prophet's Masjid first. Like these are things that I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that again. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying, Sheikh? I don't I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that again. So um, there were definitely beautiful times, man. But and, and the Jumas, you know, the Fridays, as you know, we used to leave nine thirty, ten, park up, and just yeah. sit. You know, next to, on the floor outside, yeah, relaxing for an hour or two, just doing nothing. But the mm. peace there, the kids are just running around. We have a bit of gawa and dates. Yeah, you know, the yeah. Friday was like it's a recharge, a reboost. You know, so that will and ease all the tears and the pains of the week. It will just wipe them out, and then you refresh and you're ready for another, you know, another battle for that following week. You know that. That's it. That's it. It's like a okay. Um, okay, so the, a couple of more questions. They're talking about um, subjects, the different topic uh, specialisms you can study in Medina, um, and also how can we motivate the youngsters maybe to uh, get them to go to Medina uh, or Dini Islamic universities uh, rather than Western universities? So two parts really. One is what what subjects are available, and how can we ignite the youngsters to go to Medina? As it relates to the subjects, um, as you mentioned, that when you first get to Al Medina, if the student needs to go to the Arabic Institute, uh, they will do so. And they, depending on their level, there's some type of entry exam um, that will determine the, the level that they actually get assigned to level one, level two, level three, or level four. But let's assume that somebody starts in level one whilst you're studying Arabic in level one. Um, by the time I think you get to like level two, you start to learn hadith. You start to learn a bit of fiqh, I believe, in level number three, a little bit of sirah, a little bit of Qur'an. So in the, in the Arabic Institute, you're not only studying Arabic. You're studying Arabic 
and you're also studying other sciences, but in Arabic. You know, very, very basic at that. Um, and on that note, we are actually doing, for me, so we're doing courses actually right now. We've got a course in a few days, uh, Sheikh Yusuf, going through one of the books that we studied in the Islamic <coughs> University of Al Medina called the Ta'bir, which is speaking skills. Mm -hmm. um, but by the time you finish, the, or as you're coming to the end of your time in Al Medina, uh, in, in the Arabic Institute, you now have to make a decision uh, and, and select the faculty of your choice, one of five faculties. Uh, al Sharia, which is you know Islamic law, Kulit uh, al-Hadith, which is the, prophet, the, the, the prophetic narrations of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, Kulit al-Da'wah, which is obviously inviting to uh, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Kulit al-Lughat al arabiya which is the faculty of the Arabic language, and the other one is Kulit al-Qur'an al-Kareem, the faculty of the Noble Qur'an. I chose to uh, study in the faculty of al-Hadith, that was my first choice, and by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I was accepted to study there. Uh, and if anybody's interested into the reason as to why I picked that um, particular kulia, it was for two main reasons. Number one, I was and still am fascinated to find out, you know, كيف كان يمشي رسول الله عليه الصلاة والسلام كيف كان يتكلم مع um, أصحابه ومع أزواجه ومع أعدائه عليه الصلاة والسلام How did the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام used to walk? كيف كان يأكلوا? How did he used to eat? You know, how did he used to speak and interact with his companions and his, his wives and his friends, his enemies, sorry. I was fascinated about stuff like that. So I wanted to pick a kulia that was going to, um, you know, grab my attention. Secondly, uh, when I looked at the students that were, you know, years in front of me, I just found that the, the caliber of students that kulia al-hadith was uh, producing was more in line with where I wanted to be. And I think that's so important in life to have a vision, you know, to see where you want to see yourself. And then when you see that, when you see where you want to be, you just find out, okay, well, what's the path for me to do? What path do I have to tread to get there? And then you just tread it to the best of your ability. Um, and that's what I did. I was not thinking about, in all fairness, um, the needs of the community back home, because that's not where I was at the time. Some people say, oh, you know, Study in a faculty that the people of your land, i.e. London, are going to be in need of. And la shak, we're in, 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 obviously we, everybody needs aqidah, but we're in, in the UK, we're, we're in need of fiqh, understanding the religion. So I do definitely understand why brothers go to other kuliyat. But for me at the time, I said, look, if I'm going to be here for the next six years, five, six years, I'm going to do something that I enjoy. It was, it was very, very selfish at the time. And I don't have any regrets. Uh, for going to the Kulia of Al Hadith, to be honest with you, it was um, the most, well, one of the most challenging, but the best time of my life. Best time of my life. Yeah, mashallah. But just gonna add to that. Sorry. Um, so you've got all the Sharia side, and like I said, the the stuff that I was working on the the new side of the campus in 2012. Um, and I saw recently messages now. Subhanallah, we've got the College of Sciences, uh, IT. Um, um, what else was there? I forgot now. There's three. Oh, medicine, medical kind of. Um, you've got, yeah, you've got these new sciences now, which are secular stuff that I saw a message go around recently as well. If anyone's interested to study a bachelor's in physics or biology, can also apply to Medina University. The good thing is that you're going to study, oh, engineering, that's it, engineering, IT, and sciences. Now, so you could potentially now apply to Medina and get a scholarship to study an engineering bachelor's. But like you said, what they do in the Arabic, every year you have modules in your engineering, throughout your engineering, you're still going to do basic aqidah, you're going to do basic fiqh, you're going to do some basic uh, hadith, and you're going to do basic uh, akhlaq. You know, so they're building up, what they're trying to do now is produce a hybrid. So you have a practicing engineer, you know, Muslim. <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a good, you know, kind of vision where you got an engineer who's a bit more grounded in his beliefs um, yeah. and just a, a secular guy who's an amazing architect but doesn't even pray. So now you're going to have a one who understands Allah and he's a good architect um, and has the basics of the deen. So you do have that. That's um, and that's what we've been working on, that uh, the, the new campuses uh, or the new sites, so, alhamdulillah. Um, what was the second part of the question, Sheikh? You said the second part is those youngsters, how can we... You and I motivate them to, you know, have a vision to go to Medina. Uh, how can we 
create some sparks inside them to go to uh, study Dini subjects rather than to go to Western unis and study Western subjects. I suppose, uh, Sheikh Yusuf, the responsibility that you and I have and all of the other Tulab and the expats is that we have to lead by example. We have to show them that um, not necessarily what we say, but the what we do, how we interact with them to show them that, you know, people that do go to study in Saudi Arabia, they're not just rough and tough and they only have one way of looking at things. They're actually approachable, nice people. You know, they're down to earth people, they're relatable people. And I think that's the biggest uh, ni'mah that we can, or the, the, the biggest, uh, um, you know, form of da'wah that we can give to the youth to show them that we, you know, to, to be an exemplary example, you know, but, when I, when, I heard, when I heard you uh, say the question the first time, the first thing that came to my mind is if somebody has been raised in the UK, right? He's been raised just in a normal household where he's allowed to listen to music, indulge in watching films and um, going out with his friends, maybe going to nightclubs. It's going to be very, very difficult now. When that person gets to that 15, 16, 17, to try to persuade that person to go to Al Medina, you're almost fighting a losing battle. So I think that there is the mistake. It's yeah. as parents, we shouldn't rely on the local imam who graduated or the local expat who, you know, achieved great things uh, in Al Medina to come back and encourage our ch children to become what we want our children to be. As parents, we need to do that. The responsibility is on our shoulders. And it doesn't start when the child's 15, 16, 17 years old, Sheikh Yusuf. It starts way before that. You know, it starts with the tarbiyah at home. So parents, even if they're not studious, they have to be very cognizant uh, concerning the, uh, the impression, the lessons that they're giving the child at home. Because that there essentially will shape the rest of the child's life. Sheikh Yusuf, how many times have you probably disciplined your kids? And you say, subhanAllah, I sound exactly like my father <laughs> or something like that, you know, because we, a lot of what we received growing up, we give. Whatever we, sorry, Chef Yusuf, I had to open up the window. I'm so hot in here. Whatever we liked growing up as a kid in terms of the values we give to our children, whatever values that we thought, you know, what I think we could, we try to give our children something better than we had growing up. So I think that parents need to, to be very, very mindful about that. Number one, to take responsibility. And number two, think about the lasting impressions that the, the, the cultivation, the tarbiyah, that they give their children now is going to have. You may say, you may, a, a parent may think, you know, I don't want to be too hard on my kid or I want him to have a happy, um, you know, a, a, a free, uh, um, uh, you know, um, what do they call it, um, upbringing. And I say, well, if that's how you want to be, then you're going to have to face the ramifications of that when that child becomes 15, 16. And they say, no, mom, I don't want to study Islam. I want to, I want to become this, which there's, no, there's nothing wrong with becoming an architect or a doctor. The, the ummah needs these things. But, um, you know, give, your, give your, your, your child the best opportunity in life by starting now, such that when they're at that age, then, you know, it's... Um, it's going to be easier for you as a parent, you know, to, to, to kind of accept the decision that that child decides to make. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Um, the, the, there was a question regarding application. We know now these days the application is online. No. So whoever's um, sending, you know, we'll, I'll get it out onto the group. They've got some group where they message. So we'll send it out. The application now is fully online. Um, they said how to increase their chances. Of course, you need to that child needs to have a good relationship with the local imam and the masjid because like you said, someone's got to give an endorsement. So what you said at Tazkia, someone's got to vouch for him, say, yeah, this lad comes to the masjid, you know, he's a good boy. He's not involved in any dodgy stuff. Um, so that they need that. And if they can do some, like you got, mashallah, some Arabic courses, this would definitely, I encourage anyone to take some, you know, preparatory foundational Arabic. Um, so that will make your life easy if Allah accepts you. Um, so definitely we'll send out the link for the online application and just, these short courses, yeah. Just to yeah. add to that, Yusuf, uh, what you said was absolutely correct. You have to have a good reputation in your community. It, it's definitely advantageous if you're somewhat studious. You're not going to go to Medina and become a student. It's not going to happen. You have to have that, that ragba, that desire to study, 
uh, to be self-motivated. Don't expect everything to be given to you on a spoon like it is here in the UK. You know, the Arabs, they don't treat their teachers how we as Westerners treat our teachers in college and university. There's a lot of respect for the Ustad or the Sheikh or the Doctor in the, in the Arab lands. Um, so that's something that I would uh, definitely say. But above everything that we've both of us have mentioned, ultimately, uh, Karim, it is down to the will of Allah whether that person gets in. You could, I've heard stories of people having tazkiyat from big scholars and they don't get in. I got one from Imam Shakil, Abu Usama, and um, uh, uh, Suleiman Ghani, I believe, the Imam of Tutin. Yeah, yeah, Sheikh Suleiman, yeah. Let me tell you, let me tell you something about that story right there. I got a tazkiyah from him through my wife's uncle who used to work in the masjid with his father with Sheikh Suleiman. I'd never met him a day in my life. Maybe just seen him on TV, uh, maybe walking in Tutin now and again. So he wrote me the tazkiyah on the strength of my wife's uncle. Got the tazkiyah, I said, Jazakallah khair. I didn't care how I got it at the time. I just wanted a tazkiyah. Went to Medina, ended up getting in. Unbeknown to Sheikh Suleiman Ghani, of course. Abu Usama and Imam Shakir obviously knew because I was in contact with them. So years, I'm talking years. I'm in the kulia right now, Sheikh. Into my talab, I'm walking in the Prophet's Masjid. Who do I see sitting on the floor? Sheikh Suleiman Ghani. So I walk up to him. And he don't know who I am from, from, from a regular person in the, in, in the masjid. I said, Asalaamu Alaikum. And I introduced myself and I said, you, you don't know who I am. But after Allah wa ta'ala, you're partially responsible for me being here seeking knowledge. And I felt that that was such a powerful thing to do to somebody, to let them know that, you know, it reminds you of the hadith that, you know, uh, the abd, the servant might utter a statement and he لا يلقي لها بالا أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم it doesn't give it much thought but it will call it will be so beloved to Allah it will cause that servant to enter the paradise and the same is true for the statement that we utter wherein we don't give it much thought but it will earn the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and subsequently the abode will be the fire and similarly we can do things with our actions Sheikh Yusuf you could just do something for somebody that you, it, it's like water for duck's back. It doesn't matter to you. It wasn't a big deal, but that could effectively change somebody's life. And the lesson I learned from that was a life lesson at that. Never, ever underestimate the power of either a kalima tayyiba, a good word, or the ramifications of a kalima sayyia, of an evil word, and also the, the, the potential ramifications of doing a good action to somebody. You don't know how it's going to affect their lives. Do you think right now Sheikh Suleiman knows that on the 21st or 22nd of July 2020, me and you are speaking about him, reminiscing about the Nitma? He, he, he probably, he, unless he's tuned in, he won't yeah. know. Yeah. You know. And I think that's a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, it is, mashallah. I just want to add from that a about good deeds and things. You know, we don't know which deeds are going to be the winner and how we're going to influence. So we've got um, Al Fitra Wani, they got a campaign mashallah at the moment to get out billboards across the country to give um you know these good kalima these words of hadith and things across the country um they raised money already uh, for a, a few and they wanted they've got a target to get about 100 um and to get a billboard for two weeks it's about 215 pounds and so uh, the al fitra group that you know they're always collecting and inshallah these are the 10 blessed days so whatever you give will multiply and and you know that you put towards and that billboard someone reads and you don't know whose hearts change and how many people and who enters a fold of Islam because of that message. So I urge your brothers and sisters to, um, you know, donate for the cause, give whatever you can, never belittle it, never underestimate it. And you don't know, subhanAllah, but you will know. We know that you will know on Yawm Al-Qiyamah when yeah. that scale starts getting heavy and you're thinking, where are these deeds coming from? No. What is going on here? Yeah. Then, Allah, that testimony will come. It was that five pound you gave to Lusha Masjid. It was that yeah. ten pound for that billboard. You yeah. know, and that's that's the beauty that we want. No, uh, totally. Don't forget, uh, brothers and sisters, to contribute whatever you can to this uh, great cause. Right, Alhamdulillah, we're coming. We're uh, coming towards the end of our session. Um, other questions? Yeah, we're good. We're um, 
What else would you like to add? What else haven't we added? Maybe we can do a summary, another five uh, five minutes or so to wrap things up, inshallah. I mean, uh, what I would like to uh, to say, Sheikh Yusuf. I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm accustomed to people asking me about my time in Medina and how to get over there. But, um, you know, one thing that has to be mentioned, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, we have to remember that the place don't make you holy. You mentioned something at the beginning of your lecture. You said that, you know, and Medina is for the Muslims. It's not for the Arabs. It's not for the Brits. It's not for the, the Americans. It's for the Muslims. And similarly, seeking knowledge isn't only restricted to Al Medina. And I get it. Medina is a place of Barakah and there's ulama there. But at the end of the day, knowledge can be sought anywhere from the, from, 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 from the comfort of your own home. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it easy for us in this day and age that we're, we're, we're living in. So um, that's very, very uh, important to know. And as much as I and you mentioned that we respect the, the student for his talab, his ability to seek knowledge for an extended amount of time. Um, people are people at the end of the day and the place don't make you holy. Just because you may have gone to Medina or you may have graduated from Al Medina, that doesn't necessarily now mean that this person should be put on a pedestal. We judge people by the contents of their character, you know, not by the accolades that they have achieved because that in the absence of sincerity is useless. Useless for the Abd and the, and the Rabbi. It's useless for the servant as it relates to his relationship with his Lord. And it's, it's, it's useless for anybody else. So, um, you know, strive if you can to go to Medina. Strive if you can, as you mentioned, the beautiful hadith, to, to die in Al-Medina. But if you're unable to do so, it might not be written that it's for us to, to, to even go Medina or die in Medina. Then that should have absolutely no bearing on your, um, your focus and your determination and your commitment to be a good Muslim, an upright Muslim, and also to seek uh, knowledge. And on that note, as I mentioned briefly, uh, we've got a course at the end of this month. And anybody that's following me on Instagram, uh, you'll find the post where we're doing a ta'bir course. It's a speaking course. It's a four-week course, three days a week. And um, the course is as cheap as £50. You know, we try to give inexpensive options because I understand that there are people that won't be able to afford the more premium version. So if you're interested, definitely uh, check out the Instagram page and the the uh, the course uh, uh, introduction pack. If you're, you know, if you want to know more or if anybody can contact me, then I'll be more than happy to share those details with anybody that wants to, you know, start their journey to learning Arabic. Yeah, no, no. This is um, a fantastic reminder. You're right. The, the place is good. Alhamdulillah. You and I have seen lots and, you know, it's not good to really project. But we have a whole mixture of amazing things in Medina and, and also not so amazing things because people are not perfect. And the place is a place and you have fantastic ulama that are here in Britain, in America. You know, mashallah, have not even set foot in Medina. But mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them. They made their intention. They have sought the knowledge. The ikhlas lillah is there. You know, so I think the key thing is, what do you want to do with your life? And I think a big message now, and I've said this, you know, with all the webinars I've been doing since Ramadan during lockdown, is subhanAllah, we are nearing the end of times. We... We are, you know, Rasulullah was, and the companions were worried 1400 years ago that they're close to end of the world, Armageddon, the Jal coming. And we've passed another 1400 years and we're still sitting around thinking there's another thousand years left. Well, there isn't going to be another thousand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, but the signs are, you know, fast approaching. And really what is going to be our savior is going to be the Iman. And this pandemic should be a lesson for everyone, all of us, how we, how that, it's been a lockdown in every way that it's given us an opportunity to develop our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because many of us had forgotten our relationship with Allah and were very entrenched in the dunya. And this was kind of put a brakes on many of the people who are in the fast lane. Uh, you know, they start rethinking and reflecting about their life. So this is what we want to think about. What is ultimately going to benefit me, my wife and my children when I leave this world, you know, when I... When I finish the job, when I, the promotion, the house, the, the cars, you know, these are all temporary. These are all going to come to an end. And many people during this pandemic are being called back, back to where? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't know. And uh, Brother Ismail, you, me, we don't know who's next. But is that we want to be ready. We don't want to be caught off guard that it's time. Malik al-Maut comes 
and we're thinking we haven't done enough. You know, so and this is for these ten days also. These are amazing days. You know, do it. Do the istighfar. Do the tasbih. Do you know the uh, adhkar? Do all those things because to maximize. Because there's no guarantee. No one is uh, going to be here forever. Um, and never delay good deeds. And also make the intention for those deeds. And also the knowledge we know that Subhanallah, this is an honor and a privilege. Not everybody is chosen. Um, and we know that from the hadith that if Allah wants good for somebody, uh, the Prophet has mentioned that then he will give you understanding of the deen. So anyone who gets chosen, this itself is a massive honor that you have accepted that challenge to seek knowledge, whether it's in Arabic, whether it's in Quran, you know, you start memorizing, whether it's uh, at the seerah, whether it's anything. Um, so really live today for today. There's no guarantee for tomorrow. Um, and this world, subhanAllah, is going to come to an end and it's we're nearing the time. The signs are falling, uh, coming very close. Many, many, many of the minor signs have gone. We're waiting for some of the big major signs. And we can see if we think critically, you know, that um, we're getting there because of the, the, the situation we find ourselves, the morals that we find ourselves, the way society is developed, the oppression, the injustice we see. These are all kind of indicators to where we're heading so we need to save our families uh, our communities so inshallah you know that um do please think about this time what we have in lockdown for reflection about your own life uh, about to start you know if we're struggling with praying some of us think about it the connection with allah you know what what kind of a muslim are we if we don't have the basics to show that we're not talking to allah um so really give a reflection to everybody um, to think about our own self and our destiny that uh, not about 70 years of this life but 70 trillion billion years of eternity you know where where do you want the success to be do you want at the expense of this dunya the eternity of sadness and misery or a bit of sacrifice in the 60 70 years for a place of eternal happiness you know where there's no bills no sadness no uh, no sleep, no tiredness, go bathroom, no stress. Everything is just continuous happiness and bliss. So this is what we want to do, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're done really. If, uh, maybe you can uh, close with a few more words as the guest of... Guest and, of and then but, we'll bring it to an end. You, you've, you've, um, you, you've said everything, mashallah. Jazakallah khair. All right, barakallah fiq. I want to thank you again, uh, you know, for taking the time out and um, may Allah protect you, preserve you. I know you're going through a lot of journeys, the family and also your projects. I remember, you know, we had that discussion about me giving you some hints in your entrepreneurial. Um, and I don't think I've really done much for you. Again, maybe a word that I've said to you that kind of gave you a bit of energy with your, you know, your Mesur project and uh, your Arabic. May Allah accept it and uh, yeah. may Allah make those small, small projects a means, you know, for you. And Yom Al Qiyamah, an excuse, inshallah, because they're beautiful little things. I mean, Jazakallah khair. You know, and keep it going, uh, keep them moving forward. Uh, whatever, you know, whatever we can do, let's uh, let's hook up sometime soon as well, inshallah. Inshallah, ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Yeah, and give my, give my regards and salams to the, the family. And um, uh, yeah, Shaykh Imam, uh, Imam Shakil, if you see him. Yeah. Yeah, so it's good. So we'd. On this note, I think I want to again, Barakallah Fiqh, um, and the brothers and sisters, you know, for tuning in. I hope we didn't let you down. This topic is a lifetime topic, you know. Uh, we need to do more more sessions. Uh, inshallah, maybe if you have time, we'll, we'll do some other sessions, at Medina Diaries or something, you know, because it's something that fascinates people, motivates people, gives people some hope. And this is what we live on, you know, hope and uh, hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because that's what's amazing and hope keeps us going. So inshallah, we will plan to do uh, some more further sessions so that, uh, you know, we, we share the blessing that Allah gave us, that Allah gave us the opportunity to spend uh, such a long time. And also I make dua that we can go back soon because of the way things are. Um, we don't want to go back. This is our home uh, and we want to return there. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also those who haven't been, may Allah invite everybody uh, to go there and experience this beautiful uh, place. Uh, to uplift our Iman. Ameen, Ya Rabbi. Barakallahu feek, Ya Sheikh Yusuf. And thank you once again.
for the opportunity to uh, have a conversation with you uh, and also to address all of the, the brothers and sisters. I really appreciate your time. No problem. All right, bro. Take care. Yeah, you too. Like, look after yourself, Shay. All right, man. All right, All take right. care. Salam alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.